Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief at Semiconductor Engineering. I'm with Steve Wu of Rambus. We're going to talk today about the challenges of increasing performance and what that does to memory. Steve, obviously everybody wants processing to go faster. They want to process more data. What is that actually, what are the implications of that on memory? Well, first of all, you've got to try and move that data faster than before, but there's uh, some interesting challenges with doing that. You know, not only do you have to make the circuits um, work and toggle faster than they did in the previous generation, but you also have to get the whole system to work well, meaning, you know, you have to be able to assemble it onto like a PCB or an interposer, and you have to get that signaling right so the data can be reliably transmitted back and forth. And some of these physical effects are really starting to become big limiters as we as we look to the future well let's take a closer look sure steve what are we looking at yeah so here i um, tried to summarize some of the more important challenges for trying to make memory go faster on the left here you can see just a partial list of the kinds of effects you have to consider as you go faster so running across the the top there on the horizontal axis you see um, different speeds and as we go faster and faster what you see below it are a number of bars it just represents some of the different kinds of effects you have to consider in order to make sure you can move that data reliably. And you can kind of see, um, you know, back 20 years ago when we were going at much lower speeds, the number of effects, relatively speaking, was much smaller that you had to consider than today. But as time's gone on and we've gone to much faster data rates, you can see that there's many more things you have to think about. And so it's really more than any one person can keep in their head. And so it's really caused not only uh, Rambus, but the whole industry to think more about what are the best ways to model some of these things and predict what you have to do in order to come up with a good, reliable design. So going forward, what we're seeing is that the importance of modeling is becoming greater and greater with every generation. You know, these are the kind of effects we used to see on analog going back years ago. They've now moved into digital, right? Yeah, I mean, a lot of this is, um, it's, it's where you see the growing importance of things like mixed signal design, where digital circuits have to worry about some of these kinds of things because of the way they're fundamentally implemented, but also the circuits which toggle the wires that go back and forth between an SOC and a DRAM, you know, those are fundamentally analog at the point where you're moving and driving the wires. And so not only do you have to worry about the design of those circuits, you have to worry about how the traces are laid out on PCBs and interposers so that you can take into account these types of effects. So basically what you have going on here is you have much more processing, you have much more noise, and you have much higher density, right? And now you have to live with all of this and manage it. That's right. I mean, people always want to try and do more, so they want to go faster. Uh, the world is, is generating much more data every year than it had the previous year. So you've got to try and find a way to move that data and process it more quickly. And then the physical constraints are getting more challenging as well, because people want to try and do more in a smaller volume of space. We see a lot of these effects really compounding each other. And, and like you mentioned, I mean, it, it really underscores the importance of being able to accurately model what's going on. We also aren't necessarily using the same kind of processing elements as we were in the past. So we have lots of different processing elements. So these designs are increasingly heterogeneous. Does that impact what goes on here as well? Absolutely. I mean, what you see is these days, um, complex processors and SOCs can have hundreds, uh, you know, a couple hundred different IP blocks in them. And so those blocks sometimes are designed in-house, sometimes they're acquired by third parties. And somebody is eventually responsible, the, the system designer, the SOC designer is responsible for stitching them all together. And so you have to figure out how to make all of those blocks and functions play well, not only by themselves, but play well with the neighboring blocks. So you have to think about uh, making sure that the power is being reliably delivered to each of the blocks and that there's not as much crosstalk and interference between those blocks as well. So, and then that's just on the chip. And then obviously you have more chips that you're putting closer to each other on the board. And so they have to be good neighbors when they're on a board as well. So a lot of challenges these days around power delivery and power integrity as well as just signal integrity and, and just reliable design. 
So how do you deal with these effects? Obviously, they aren't going away. Obviously, you can the best you can do is manage them. But how do you manage them effectively? The number one thing that the industry and Rambus has both really invested in and done well in is that modeling capability, really being able to understand before you try and build a system where the challenges are going to be and then designing in a way that you can address those challenges. And really, you know, if you can get all those things right, uh, what I show in the middle here is an example of our GDDR6 evaluation board for our FI product that we have for sale now. If you can get all those things right, then what you'll see is that when you get your silicon back, you'll have very good characteristics. And you can actually see at the bottom in the middle there, it's an example of our transmit eye when we ran our GDDR6 FI at 18 gigabits per second, which is a little bit higher than the, the spec standard rate but we knew people are going to want to try and go beyond the standard rate. So we had prepared our technology to go a little bit faster. And you can see the eye is very clean. And, and that's really because of very solid modeling and, and kind of this expertise we've developed over the last 20 years in really what to model and how to model it. Any big surprises when you put these things together? Because one of the big uh, variables here is use cases. The way you use a device may be radically different than the way I use a device. And as a result of that, it may behave completely differently. Yeah. And really what becomes important is that when you create a design and specify a design is that you understand the requirements from your customers about the types of environments they're going to use it in. And then to make sure that as you release your technology, you're very clear about how to use that technology and what the requirements are. Uh, for pairing it with, uh, you know, with other elements that may go on a chip. So I wouldn't necessarily say that you know, there were too many surprises. I think the bigger kind of surprise uh, across the industry is just how rapidly these standards are uh, evolving and how much people want to go faster and they want to get to the next level beyond what you've just created. Then what do you see as some of the challenges of, of really boosting the speed here? Because obviously everybody always wants to go faster. We have more data. We have more new things that we want to do with this. Yeah, that's right, Ed. Like I've mentioned before, certainly when we produce a technology, there's no resting on any kind of laurels or anything like that. It's time to move on to the next thing. And so we and the rest of the industry are seeing tremendous need to continue improving the data rates for things like GDDR, HBM, and even DDR. So on the right here um, is an example. Uh, this came from a really nice presentation from Micron at uh, DesignCon uh, a few years ago. And what they're showing is they're showing some of the things that had to be done in order to get to a system level data rate of, of 16 gigabits per second for GDDR6. And it gives you an idea of, of kind of what you need to think about. It turns out that not only do you have to worry about the actual circuits on the chip toggling at the right data rates, but the design of those wires and that channel that the data moves around, that's becoming more of a limiter these days as well. So it's a lot of the physical implementation aspects are, are an important limiter. And what they're showing is they're showing that in this particular case, the top on the right there, that um, via stubs were getting to be an important limiter in the signal integrity. And you can see on these two eyes at the bottom right, the baseline eye there is basically closed. That's because, again, there were some limitations in the way that channel was actually implemented. But through some pretty basic and known techniques via back drilling and then using one tap of uh, decision feedback equalization, DFE, they were able to actually open up those eyes. And so really what they're showing is that through some you know, known techniques, there are ways to continue improving the data rate and continuing to open those eyes. So you know, the industry is clever, a lot of very, very smart people. And Really what it comes down to, again, is that combination of modeling and, and understanding the physical environment you're going to be in. But it bodes well for trying to continue improving the data rates because these types of techniques, um, you know, there are other techniques that can continue to move the data rates forward. Do those eyes stay open? You're talking about physical effects before. Do those eyes stay open as certain parts of this chip age differently? Aging is an important artifact uh, that you need to think about. And so in the design of our circuits, we look at aging across the circuits and we look at aging across some of the major components of the memory system as well. We even you know, uh, typically simulate across very wide ranges of things like temperatures, ranges of voltages and things like that to accommodate what will happen when, uh, when aging happens. And there's, there's even simulations you do specifically around aging that will tell you what the performance will look like across a lifetime 
for those circuits in the system. As we move down into the most advanced nodes, the reality is a lot of these are not going to be single chip implementations. They're probably going to be advanced chips in addition to other chips in, a, in an advanced package. What happens in terms of the various interactions here and the noise and, and everything else? Does it get better? Does it get worse? Because these packages are getting denser and we want to be able to architect these so that the data really does flow very cleanly without any interruptions. Yeah, that's a good question. So we're seeing a lot of interest in chiplets. And certainly if you look at um, some of the processors that are either out in the market or have been announced from people like AMD and Intel, you're seeing more of an adoption of a chiplet strategy where um, you know, multiple uh, small chips, chiplets are connected together on a common substrate uh, and, uh, and it's brought to market that way. And what's nice about it, it's got some really nice benefits. So you can isolate certain features and you can only put the most demanding parts of the design in the most advanced process nodes. So you can get some efficiencies there. And then some of the other types of technologies, things like uh, are related to things like IOs and things like that, which don't tend to change as quickly as maybe core processor technology does. Those can actually stay in uh, maybe a slightly older process node. So it's a little bit cheaper and, uh, and then you can just keep using that chiplet as well. So that's, the, that's one of the benefits. The challenge, like you mentioned, is that now you've got to package all these things together into, into one package and you have to come up with a good interconnect technology to do it. And you're trying to do that all in a small space. So you're trying to deliver power to it as well. And you're trying to make sure that there's um, enough isolation between those chiplets that they're not impacting each other. So there's a, um, a host of nice benefits if you can really do it, but it does make the design a little bit more challenging. And, and what it really does as well is when you have these chiplets, it introduces more IOs because now you have uh, the, you know, the chiplets all talking to each other as well. So you know, lots of uh, interesting challenges and optimization points to think through. So it's a, it's a great place of innovation for the industry. It just gets harder and harder. Steve Wu, thanks for a great explanation. Thanks, Ed.